We are in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Paul concludes chapter 13 by saying, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean. But it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement Give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy and inspired word. Accept him whose faith 
is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Point number one, not everybody has the same degree of faith. Point number two, there are such things as disputable matters. Uh, Pastor Rudd, could you explain what, what does the word disputable mean? I'm so glad you asked. Disputable means that people can disagree about that. This person feels this way, this person feels the opposite. That's a dispute. And there are some things where people feel opposite each other. People who are Christians, people who love the Lord, people who believe that God has provided salvation in Christ Jesus, they still don't agree on everything. Did you know that? Now, there are those who think that we're supposed to all come under the authority of one church headquartered somewhere overseas and, uh, and, and basically let the hierarchy of that church tell us the answer so that there will be no more disputes. We just do whatever we're told by the hierarchy. That apparently is not what the Apostle Paul or the Holy Spirit had in mind because what is stated here is that basically we ought to be able to love one another and get along with each other and honor one another even when we have disagreements. In other words, we don't have to get somebody to impose on all members of the body of Christ the ultimate answer to every question. There's room for disputing, for disagreement, for different perspectives within the body of Christ. Now, there are some things that are absolutely non-negotiable. And the Apostle Paul certainly makes that clear repeatedly, even in this letter. And in his other letters, he makes it very clear there are certain things absolutely non-negotiable. If you think Jesus is one of many ways to God, you're not a believer. You're lost. You need to get saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. But Paul gives examples here of what he's talking about. And they don't have to do with how we're saved. They have to do with what God wants us to do. And here's a radical thought. God might want this person to do this and this person to do that. I believe that I was supposed to wear a brown shirt this morning. I'm looking around the room and I see that Miss Miriam has on a brown shirt. Um, I see that Miss Catherine has on a brown shirt. I see that Miss Kay has on a brown shirt. I think that Miss Beth has on a brown shirt. Apparently the rest of you are not walking in the spirit. Now, I mean, wouldn't that be an insane perspective if I really thought that anybody who didn't put on the same color shirt that I did this morning was somehow not in touch with God? That would be utterly crazy. Well, folks, it's almost that crazy to think that everybody is supposed to do the same thing in all areas of life. Should we all be driving SUVs or should some of us be driving Priuses or should we all be driving Priuses? I heard a preacher um, who went around the country back in the 1980s telling people that there was no way you could be a serious follower of Jesus Christ and drive a BMW. And the reason was because BMWs are too luxurious. They're too nice. And Christians are supposed to live a life of self-denial. Well, I'm sorry. That fella had no business driving a BMW. But he also had no business telling everybody else that they couldn't drive a BMW. Because some of the people he was telling that they couldn't drive a BMW had gotten BMWs because they thought their roles was just too luxurious. You understand? In other words, for him to spend this much of his income on a BMW would be obscene. But for those people to get a BMW was like having a dinner out at a restaurant. Okay? I mean, it just wasn't that big a deal to them. They were living modestly and only driving a Beamer. Now, you know, 
I, I, I thought that BMW stood for big money waster. <laughs> well, it, it does for a lot of people. But I've got a friend who actually has made money driving Mercedes. He's made money. He will buy an, an older used Mercedes, drive it for a long time, and then sell it for more than he paid for it. And he's done it more than once. I'm just, I wish I had his touch. <laughs> I, I marvel at how God allows some people to do things that I would never even think possible. And yet it turns out God doesn't call all of us to do exactly the same thing when it comes to lifestyle. Well, Pastor, we should be able to agree, however, there are certain principles in Scripture. For instance, the Bible says that a man shall not wear that which pertaineth to a woman, and a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. And so when I see women walking around wearing pants, it's very offensive to me. And I know I've heard you preach, and I know that you're a man of God, and I understand that, but I don't understand. I visited your campus, and I saw there that you had people who worked for you of the female persuasion, <laughs> who, who, were, who were wearing uh, not, not just uh, slacks even, but blue jeans, blue jeans. Now that is that which pertaineth to a man. Okay, ladies, you need to look feminine. And guys, if I catch you wearing girl jeans, you're going to hear about it. Okay? But I would submit that there is a difference between guys' jeans and girls' jeans. And girls should not wear guys' jeans. And guys should not wear girls' jeans. Not even if you're in a Christian rock group. Is that clear? There should be a difference between male and female, but what that difference looks like depends on conscience. Do you understand? And it's not up to one person to decide for everybody else in the body of Christ what's appropriate. I'll give you another example. I went to preach at a church that has been giving money to the ranch. And they asked me to please come and speak uh, in an evening service, and I was delighted and honored to do so. I drove to this place. I'd never been there before. I drove there. It was a, 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 an older rural church building, uh, very quaint, um, fairly large, and it was teeming with people, which is generally a good sign, okay? There were lots of folks there. They welcomed me warmly. I went inside, and within the first few minutes, I could just tell this is a King James only church. I happened to have brought my NIV <laughs> translation with me that night. I had a wonderful message prepared from a text that I did not have memorized. And I thought, if I go to read the text, and it's not in the King James, we're going to be sunk. And so I thought about my options. They didn't have pew Bibles. And that would have been hard to hide anyway. Why isn't he reading from his Bible? What sort of Bible do you suppose he has? I thought about taking the Bible off the communion table and carrying it up to the pulpit. <laughs> saying, this is a marvelous thing. I think I'm going to use this large type edition here tonight. Uh, I decided that would not be believable either. And I might hurt myself trying to carry the thing. And so I carried my NIV Bible into the pulpit and I changed my text and my message to a passage that I had memorized in the King James. And I recited the passage. I asked them all to turn in their Bibles. They turned to the passage and I recited to them a passage that I had learned when I was a preschooler. And, and I then preached a message from that text and everybody was happy. Now, including, I think, the Lord, um, who was, I'm sure, amused. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. I wasn't trying to deceive those people. I was trying to keep those people from stumbling. Because if I preached to them from the NIV, 
they would mistakenly believe that I didn't believe the Bible. You know, the Bible, the King James Bible. Because to them, those are synonymous. The Apostle Paul says, you know what you believe about these disputable things? You really ought to keep to yourself. You don't need to go around advertising that I believe we're able to do this. Now, Paul says very explicitly and more than once in this passage, folks, all foods are clean. I'm telling you, I'm fully persuaded all foods are clean. There's no food that in and of itself is bad. If you receive the food with thanksgiving, it's fine. You don't have to worry about, you know, where'd this come from? But he says not everybody has the freedom in their conscience to do that. Some people, he describes them as having a weaker faith. They're the weaker brother. And he says not just, they can do it, it's okay, go ahead. He says, no, if your conscience doesn't allow you to do that, then you ought not to do it. Whatever is not of faith is sin. If you're doing it thinking, well, so-and-so says it's okay, and so-and-so says it's okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Uh Uh-uh. You need to seek the Lord. You need to let that be an opportunity to pursue him and ask him, God, what do you want me to do? Because God might want you to be like a Nazarite in the Old Testament who wasn't allowed to do what the other people were allowed to do. God didn't tell all the Jews, you can't do this. But he told the Nazarites, you can't do that. And the Nazarites would be sinning against God if they disobeyed what God told them. But if everybody else thought they had to be a Nazarite, they'd be trying to enter into a calling that wasn't theirs. Likewise, if the Nazarite said, because I am a Nazarite and I do these things, I am holy and all those people who aren't Nazarites aren't. No. We're holy to the Lord. And he is the one who decides for each of us what we should and should not do when it comes to these matters of application of biblical principles and how we live out our lives. And he gives another example besides food and besides drink. He talks about days of the week. Verse 5 of chapter 14, one man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Did you hear that? He doesn't say we've got to figure out who's right and who's wrong. He says each one should be fully convinced in his own mind and do what God tells him. If God wanted me to not wear socks every Tuesday, thankfully he's never asked me to do that, but if God said, I want you as a reminder that you are to have your steps ordered by the Lord to abstain from wearing socks on Tuesdays. I would think that was a very peculiar thing. I would wonder if it was just my neurotic OCD kicking in. But if I thought that God was asking me to not wear socks on Tuesdays, I would not wear socks on Tuesdays. But if I decided, because I think God is asking me to not wear socks on Tuesdays, we're instituting a new rule at the ranch, and that is on Tuesdays, nobody wears socks. Or none of the men wear socks. Or no one over 50 wears socks. Or whatever other silly interpretation I wanted to impose. That would be sick. Okay? That would just be sick. That would just be twisted. It is not up to me or to you to impose on everybody else in the body of Christ what God has told us to do that is not in the Bible. It's our sense of God's leading about what we're supposed to do. Is that clear? Okay, but what if it is in the Bible, like that thing about, you know, a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. Okay, we all have to agree that men should look like men and women should look like women. And I will go ahead and tell you, if you can't tell whether that's a man or a woman, why are you offended by the fact that they're wearing blue jeans? Is that clear? Now, I, I will say, I've been some places where I've seen some people, and it was pretty scary, because I wasn't sure whether to say yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. Okay? It's like, 
excuse me, could you say something so I'll know whether you're a man or a woman? Okay, I still can't tell. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, are, there are times when people do not live according to God's standard. But a whole lot of the time, people are living according to God's standard. They're just not living according to ours. And that, folks, is a problem with us, not them. If we think everybody's supposed to be just like us and do things just like us, then we're messed up. We're not believing the Scriptures. Because what Scripture says is, each man should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. He who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Please notice that. Whether you are an abstainer or a participant, you ought to be giving thanks to God. You ought to be giving thanks to God. If it ruins it for you that other people can do it and you can't, you're not living as under the Lord. When I was growing up, we couldn't go to the movies. I don't know who decided that. We didn't have a Protestant pope. We didn't even have a fundamentalist pope. I think we had a bunch of would-be fundamentalist popes. But anyway, um, I could name a few. <laughs> But some of them founded schools and some of them had newspapers. But, um, but the fact is, somehow, the, the decision had been made by some fundamentalist poobah who didn't believe in poobahs that, uh, that Christians don't go to movies. And I'll tell you why. Because I remember. Because I asked. It's not that all movies are bad, but the problem is you might be going to a movie that's okay and someone sees you and thinks, well, that person's a Christian. If they can go to the movie, then I guess I can too. And they might end up going to a bad movie and it would be your fault because you led them into sin because you gave them the impression it was okay to go to the movies. Okay, I can kind of see that, kind of. Sort of. So I can't go to any movies? Well, I couldn't until we moved from Illinois to North Carolina. And apparently, if you're a Christian in North Carolina in the 1960s, you can go to the movies. But it has, you have to be really careful that it's not like a multiplex where they show bad movies and good movies. You have to go to a place that's very evidently showing a good movie when you're going into the theater. And then it's apparently okay, especially if it's an opportunity for you to sort of use it as a witnessing tool. And so then that's okay. The guy who really began to lead us all down the path toward carnality was Billy Graham. Because he started producing Christian movies through worldwide pictures. And they showed them not in churches where Christian movies were supposed to be shown and always had been shown and nobody but Christians would come. Billy apparently wanted to reach people who weren't already Christians, and so he showed them in theaters and got pastors to bring people to the theaters to see the movies, and people got saved in the theaters. This really, really messed with our minds because, I mean, it was a theater, but folks were getting saved through the presentation of the gospel. Oh, I guess that's okay. Is that okay? I'm not sure. Is that okay? Well, we decided it was okay. But after all, the 1960s is kind of where it all went to heck anyway. <laughs> and soon, Elvis wasn't the only one who was moving and a shaking. I'm just telling you, we live in a world that isn't all that different from the one that the Romans lived in. And Paul writes to people who are surrounded by paganism, and he says, what it looks like to live a holy life in this culture is not going to be the same for every individual. It's not going to be the same for every individual. But you better be living a holy life and doing what you're doing because you're fully persuaded that this is what God is asking you to do, and not because you're trying to fit in with the pagans out there or with the Christians over here. And you need to be sensitive to the fact that sometimes you may have freedom of conscience to do something that would be a problem for somebody else. And so for their sake, 
Just don't do it. Or at least don't do it in a way that they're going to stumble because of it. I've used this illustration repeatedly because it's one of the most obvious here at the ranch. Is it okay for a Christian female to wear a two-piece swimsuit? I wish you wouldn't bring that up. Well, I'm sorry. It needs to be addressed. Because if you think that you have to wear a one-piece swimsuit or you're ungodly, then you need to wear a one-piece swimsuit. But the reason we have a rule here at the ranch against girls wearing two-piece swimsuits is not because we think that all Christians everywhere need to make sure that females are only attired in, in one-piece swimsuits. The reason is because it is way too much trouble for our staff to have to be continually reviewing swimsuits, okay? There are more important things to do, and it's a lot easier just to make a blanket rule that applies to everybody and says, here at the ranch, females are required, males for that matter too, are required to wear one-piece lined swimsuits, okay? If I catch a guy in a two-piece, you're in trouble. I'll take away your skinny jeans. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't wear two-piece swimsuits here, not because you can't do that and be a Christian, but because it raises way too many complications here in this place. A swimsuit that was perfectly modest in April may be immodest in August. Is that clear? A style of swimsuit that may be perfectly fine on this individual is really not okay on this individual. Is that clear? And so we simply say, lined one-piece swimsuits. Like we say, take off your shoes when you're going in the house. We're not saying that's what all Christians everywhere have to do. They must take off their shoes before entering the house. We're saying that's a rule we've imposed in order to try and preserve the carpet, which we think is good stewardship. And we're going to wear lined one-piece swimsuits because we don't want to have to be making constant evaluations of, okay, turn around, uh, raise your arms. Okay, all right, you can wear that. But you'll have to check with me again after it goes through the wash. You understand? We just say, lined one-piece swimsuits. Paul says, when it comes to making decisions about what you eat, what you drink, how you Follow a schedule in terms of the days of the week. What is your attitude toward Sabbath observance and toward special holidays and all that stuff? He says, don't be judging each other. Please understand this. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand. I want you to say that with me. He will stand. One more time. He will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. You know why we're going to be declared righteous before God? It's on the basis of God making us righteous. It's not on the basis of me making you righteous or even you making you righteous. God is the one who is in the process of ongoing progressive sanctification, manifesting his holiness in the lives of his children. And he doesn't lead all of us to make the same changes, and he certainly doesn't lead us all to make the same changes in the same order at the same time. Is that clear? I've said before, I wish I could, could systematize sanctification into a multicolored chart that shows first we all need to change in this way, and then we need to change in this way, then we need to change in this way, and then when we've got those things down, we're ready to go to the next level. I could sell those. I'm telling you, I would be a rich man. I'd also be a liar. Because that's not the way God does sanctification. God leads this person to change in this area and this person to change in this area. And this person says, what is wrong with that individual that they haven't learned what I've learned? And this individual is saying, who do they think they are? They're totally out of bounds in this area over here. And you know what we need to be doing? We need to be saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That's what we need to be focused on. And we need to be loving one another. 
And we need to be considerate of one another so that we don't lead someone else to compromise their conscience and do something that God hasn't given them the freedom to do. As said before, if you feel like all Christians everywhere need to wear one-piece swimsuits, then you need to be sure and wear a one-piece swimsuit, but you need to drop the part about all Christians everywhere. Is that clear? And if you think there is nothing wrong with a two-piece swimsuit, but you find yourself around a bunch of people who don't have that freedom, get yourself a one-piece swimsuit. It's not complicated. This is not hard. What's the big deal? Is that clear? And if you find yourself visiting a King James-only church, don't lecture them on the fact that some of the modern translations are perfectly reliable and you do not have to be bound by the King James. Don't, don't, just don't go there. There's no reason to. That's not your job. But if somebody asks you, as someone asked me, I notice that you tend to use a modern translation. Why do you do that? And I said, because my goal is to be understood. I want people to understand what God says in his word, which is why the King James Bible was translated. It was to make God's word understandable and available to the people who spoke English. Is that clear? And for most people today, Elizabethan English is like a foreign language. I happen to love it. I love Shakespeare. I love Milton. I love the King James Bible. But this isn't Shakespeare. This isn't Milton. This isn't a course on Elizabethan English. We're here to learn God's Word, and I want to make it as clear as I possibly can. Instead of reading it to you in an old English version and then having to explain to you what each of those words mean, I'd rather give it to you already translated and then talk about how it applies to our lives. Is that clear? Good. Well, there's more to say about this, but that's all we have time for this morning. I'm going to ask you to join with me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that in Christ Jesus we are declared holy because of what you have done, not because of what we do. And I pray that you would help us to believe what you say to us in your word about the way that we're to regard one another and treat one another. We're to love one another. We're to serve one another. We're to honor one another. So help us, we pray, to do that. Grant that we would not put ourselves in your place, but rather that we would be ready to give an account for why we're doing what we're doing. And that is we're fully persuaded in our own mind that this is what you've called us to do. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.